Hey, folks, welcome back to the polls. It's not Freedom Friday. It's Stephen Friday. Folks, it is 11 o'clock Central Texas time. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat, and I am in fuego. I am on fire. I'm on fire for the Lord today. And, folks, I'm going to tell you what. If you're triggered by the name Jesus, you might want to turn this stream off because we're going to be proclaiming his name. Yeah, that's a warning to you. Folks, I am so excited. I'm so excited about today's stream because this is um this is really a special thing, you know, because there's moments in your life where you just kind of like I don't know, it just impresses upon you that it's important. And I feel like this stream is important because it's the beginning of a series of conversations that I'm going to have with Steve Stags. And I'm going to introduce you folks to Steve Stags. And What's amazing about him, one of the most humble, genuine, kind, caring people I've ever met. And I'm going to tell you the story of how we met in, in this, and you're going to get to meet him, and it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But I just want you to understand the gravity of this message and, and what we're going to be sharing today and what we're going to be sharing on Fridays moving forward. This is, um, this is everything, right? I think all of our lives, we're kind of wandering around. Right. We, we're trying to make sense of things. And there are times in your life where you're like, you have these aha moments. You're like, oh, OK. But here's one of the interesting things about life is that there seems to be a framework. There seems to be a design. There seems to be some sense to this whole thing. It's not accidental. And when you start examining that and understanding it, you start realizing, oh, so this all fits together. And once you see how it all fits together, you realize, oh, okay, hold on. I may have a role to play. And one of the most amazing things about crypto is that crypto is this idea of decentralization and it's in response. It's a push back against something that I think people realized and recognized was wrong, right? Don't we, we look into life and we go, something ain't right. And we sense it, right? Do you remember the movie, The Matrix? The Matrix, right? Neo, he was a reluctant one. And what's interesting, his name was Neo, right? Mr. Anderson, but he was the one. But he was reluctantly, he's like, nah, I'm not, that's not who I am, but he sensed it. I think you sense it too. And I think that that movie is actually really interesting if you've seen it. I mean, when it came out in 1999, which I can't believe it was that long ago, it just blew my mind, right? It was just unbelievable. But I think the matrix is a really good metaphor for this idea that you know something is wrong. You don't know what it is. You can't put your finger on it. And somebody says, follow the right white rabbit. That's Steve Sags, my friends. We're following the white rabbit. Now, he doesn't want me to comment on the color of his hair, I'm sure. However, we're going to follow this white rabbit. And I'm going to tell you, you will be blessed you'll be blessed. First, we're going to get into the chat and we're going to address a couple things before we jump into this. But welcome back to the Pulse. My name is Matt. It is 1104 Central Texas time on March 17th. And I'm dedicating this stream to my dad. He passed away a year ago tomorrow. And I was thinking about him. I was looking and reading his obituary, looking at his face on the photos I had. And you know, that's another reason that this stream is really important to me. Yesterday, I dedicated my stream to my kids. Really, the first time I ever did that because I wanted to—I wanted to tell them about faithfulness and about their family. But you know, dinner table and kids and teenagers—they're like, "Yeah, Dad, man, I got bigger problems, man." I'm like, "All right, well, I'll just save this on YouTube for you later." This is another one of those things. Thinking about my dad and just thinking about all this stuff. And here's Steve Stags, right? He's, he's speaking, he's spitting wisdom. And it's going to be really, really cool. So, you know, it's not lost on me, if you know what I'm saying. Let's get into the chat, say hello to you, and then we'll welcome in the former professional baseball player. This is a really cool story, too. When you get to meet Steve, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing person. And I'm going to tell you how we met and everything, too. Tank Crypto, number one, morning chair of Heartbeat. How goes it in the Texas Hill Country? No, we're close. You know, we don't just, uh, we're sitting on the edge of the, the Hill Country, if you will. And what a beautiful place, God's country. And it's amazing how beautiful Texas is. Central Texas, whew, 
blue bonnets are out. You can just sense that it's in the air, right? Right, St. Patrick's Day, right? You got to have some green on. But the green of, of everything greening up, and then, of course, the blue bonnets of Texas. It's beautiful. DJ Dougie Peach, we know we have a stream when you come in. And then Ryan Keefe. Hey, Ryan. Ryan's had some problems with our admins and got booted out of the admin deal. And I'm not going to go into this detail, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you, Ryan. Ryan, I want to say this is a family. And you know what? Sometimes the family messes up. And sometimes we make assumptions. Here's the thing I would ask you to do. I would ask you to extend grace to those admins because here's what you don't realize. You see a, a very slim picture of all of this, but they have been hammered for a long time since July 4th of this last year when we went live. And so they've been in there around the clock, around the sun every single day. And there's been so many scammers and there's been so many people that have come in and they have, um, I mean, they've stolen 400 million tokens from people from the TNM. They've done everything they can. So there's this like heightened sense of the admins that people are like, everyone's a potential scammer. And of course you come in and you're legitimate, right? You come in and you're like, Hey man, you, you want to do great things. You want to ask good questions. And I think that there were some red flags and all that stuff. And we don't, we're not perfect people, right? We make mistakes. We, we bump into things. And I just want you to know this whole thing that we're doing here is much bigger than the money. And I think you sense that as well. I do as well. And that's really a big part of this conversation is the grace that we extend to one another, because here's the thing. It's really this concept of love, right? What does it mean to actually get outside of ourselves and put ourselves in other people's shoes? And, and you know, the admins need to do that for you and you need to do that for the admins. But we also need to just extend that to one another because you know what? I love my wife, but sometimes, sometimes not so happy, right? So we get sideways at times, but we always are committed to moving forward into working things out. So Ryan, I appreciate you. Appreciate that you care about people in the Philippines, care about crypto, care about yourself, care about your own family, care about your future. And I just want to move forward with folks like you. So that's all I have to say about that. But thanks for being here, Ryan. And thanks for sharing it. And thanks for caring enough. Here's the other thing I just want to acknowledge. Most people, they just like, well, they don't really care about it. like admins in a channel. And you've been wronged and I get it. And we're going to make things right. But here's the interesting thing about this is like, you care enough. You, you see the opportunity. You see the benefits. Let's move forward together. That's what this whole thing's about. And I think that we need more of that in crypto. And we need more of that in the interwebs, right? Because we're real people. And I recognize that in you as well. Rich Liberation, Texan, what's going on, folks? Rich Liberation, it's great to be here. Let's set the captives free. And you know what's so great about this is? And I think we'll ask, we'll ask Steve about this too. You know, who are the captives? And do we have the power to set them free? Rich Liberation, what's up? David Lee, all the way from southwestern Indiana. One year ago tomorrow, he came to my dad's funeral, traveled seven and a half hours to show a brother love because he knew I was in his challenge. We had prayed together. I hadn't met him in person. And he just drives up and he's like, just sit with you. What a friend. What a person. Just would come that far, doesn't really know you, and comes and sits with you. That's really it, right? Amazing. He reminds you. And that's what we got to do for each other remind each other you know what what are we what are we what are we doing here together andy what's going on munich germany fantastic to have friends across the world taryn let's go fantastic texas life i'm here in granbury with the family fantastic well this is going to be a family friendly stream k hudson um hello atlanta says hello jim rat crypto man crypto royalty in the house jim rat you're gonna be blessed by this one i hope that you, you stick with me through this one it's a it's gonna be amazing um my online ghost is here hexy quinn bringing the softer side and some of the sassiness to the stream i appreciate that jesus above all names texas life in the house good morning from samantha top of the morning to everyone checks my pulses in the house let's go hexaco pump incoming man you see what happened to bitcoin today wow folks we're you know we're the beneficiaries of the destruction of babylon it is burning my friends in an hour and we are the beneficiaries of that you know steve's going to use a term called the transfer we're going to ask him about that too what is that what does that mean? What's happening? What does this all mean? How does it all fit together? Is this just an accident? You find yourself here, right? You're just a, a monkey 
and you just hopped into this situation? We'll see. Afternoon, Matt. Afternoon, Hexicans and Texicans. Anthony Munoz, what's going on with the dab? Just in time, facing reality. Thanks for being here. All our friends across the pond, my condolences and prayers. Uh, to your dad, you know, thank you so much. You know, it's such a joy. It, bittersweetness, actually, is bittersweet, and it's sweet, right? The memory of my father is, is incredible, and I, I, I love that. I mean, in a way, you know, people think, well, it's so hard at this time, but you know what? I want to remember him. Right. I want to I want to think about such things, even though I guess there's pain, pain in all of that stuff. There's also some sweetness in it, too. Paul Op the seventh. What's going on? Hello, everyone. MT Fryer heart goes out to you, Matt. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate for your father, Adam. Appreciate that so much. Tortoise Johnny in the house. Um, do, do, do blue bonnets here in Granbury and Glen Rose, man. Glen Rose. What a neat place. The passion. The passion, telling the story of Jesus as he goes to the cross. Amazing story. The Church of Universal Oneness is here. Peace, love, and good health to you all. Appreciate that. A fist bump from everyone facing reality. Hex Monkey, there he is. Hex Monkey, this is going to be a good one. You need to meet Steve in person. We will hopefully do that here in May. Opa Bamian, I didn't realize Friday could get better, yet here it is. Dude, that's so nice. You guys are so encouraging. Nate Mintz. What is it? Uh, is it? Uh, is it that? Is it Leprechaun Day today? Is it? You know, when I was in college, we would have gotten up very early and drank beverages that were colored green. But you know what? Old man Crypto Harpy can't do that now. I have a feeling that maybe Steve did that once in a while back in the in the day. Um, David Lee is the legend. Carter Hill. This is the guy that introduced me to Steve. Carter's the man. What's up? Hey, brother. Good to see you, buddy. This is going to be a special one. Godfather J6, what's going on? And Hexagon, folks. All right, here we go. Let me tell you about Steve Stacks. Steve Stacks has his own Wikipedia page. Crypto Harpy doesn't have a Wikipedia page. You know, you know, you have arrived when you got a Wikipedia page. I'm going to read from this, but this is this is cool. Steve Stacks. Who is Steve Stacks? He's a former Major League Baseball second baseman who played for two seasons. He played 72 games for the Toronto Blue Jays during the 1977 uh, season and 47 games with the Oakland Athletics during the 1978 Oakland A's season. What's so awesome? I want to show you. I want to show you some cool things you saw on the thumbnail. Of um, yeah, pretty amazing. You, you saw this. This is the guy who you know. You know, a lot of the young kids today, they're really into um, the era that Steve comes from, right? Right? This, these are the men. These are the real men. You know what I'm saying? And I want to show you a picture of Steve. This is so cool. So let me share my screen for you. I'm, I'm, I'm really building him up here. He's going to be blushing, I'm sure, once, once we get in here. Let me show you this photo. This is crazy. So look at this photo. So... This is Steve Staggs. There's a number of pictures of him. This is his baseball card. He was a second baseman. This is for Toronto. And look at that mustache, man. Look at that mustache. I mean, literally every young man right now is so envious of Steve Staggs' mustache there. But it is so cool. And you know, he's got his own baseball card. He played. We're going to be talking about that. It's incredible. I love looking at all of these photos. You know, a time gone by. Look at that, man. He's like freaking Wyatt Earp. All right, enough of that. Enough of enough of fawning over over Steve Staggs here. Um, but folks, one of the things Steve would say is that was a lifetime ago. And I think we lift up things and we think of wow, professional baseball. We know it, right? I watched the natural, right? That song right at the end when the ball goes in that smashes the lights, right? Bull Durham making it to the show. And we lift up all these things in life and go, is that what it's about? And I think what's so cool about Steve Staggs and bringing him into this, he's going to give us some perspective and share with you that that was a lifetime ago. It's a lifetime ago, and it's fun. But here is the best part. Folks, is it St. Patrick's Day? Is it St. Patrick's Day today? That's a question I've got for you. Friday, March 17th. What I love about this is... Steve Staggs is the man with the mustachio and wearing the shirt like the pistachio. <laughs> Folks, welcome to The Pulse, Steve Staggs. What's up, man? 
Well, I was kind of looking around to see who the heck you were talking about. I know, I know. I didn't see anybody else in the room, so it's like, okay, Matt, where are we going with this? I just try to, you know, I try to do as much as I can because I love, I love trying to to give people a hard time a little bit, but also I want to honor you, Steve. You've really, um, you've done a lot for me, and I think you just, you know, you kind of shake it off at times. But I really appreciate you a lot, and to me, this is um, this is a joy to share what we've been sharing with other people. And I think we got to a certain point. I'm like, this is so good. Like other people need to hear this stuff, Steve. So welcome to the pulse, man. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me, man. Good yeah. To be here. You bet. You bet. So, so let me ask you about this. You, I'm going to put this photo up again and this picture of you here at Toronto. Will you tell us about this photo? You with the, the greatest mustachio and, and what was happening right there? Cause that's a pretty significant photo. And I think you remember it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that particular photo was taken at, um, in the old Tiger Stadium. Um, Mark the Bird Fidrich was, um, was pitching that particular day. For old baseball fans, they'll know him. He was a really quirky kind of guy, but he was the, the pitcher in that era, yeah. um, at least at the American League level. And, um, and I was getting ready to lead off the game and I was one of those guys that um, have learned that uh, mental preparation was really important. In fact, it was the most important part of the game. Uh, you know, you play any, anywhere from 150 to uh, 180 games, sometimes 200 games if you play winter, winter ball. And so you play a lot of games. And so the physical part eventually starts giving way to the mental and emotional part of the game. And so I had learned fairly early in my career that the mental part of the game was was literally the most important part of it. And so I did um, the majority of my preparation before a game um, while other guys were in the clubhouse. And so this is an example. Prior to this, I would I would probably be out. Um, in the dugout, swinging the back, getting loose, and watching Mark uh, or any other starting pitcher, I'd actually be watching them while they were in the bullpen getting ready. And then when they come out on the field and do get have their you know eight pitch warm up, what I'm doing here is I'm watching to see how he's delivering the ball, is he in rhythm, um, what pitches are moving, how he's actually preparing his you know. To, me, to face me. And so that picture right there is me studying him and uh, getting ready to, um, to, um, to, be, to lead off the game. And by the way, for non-baseball uh, people, what's actually happening in that situation is I'm determining how I'm going to make him pitch to me. Wow. While he is determining how he's going to make me hit what he wants to hit. And so that's the strategic part of the interplay that's happening right there. And what happened? What happened at that at bat, Steve? Yeah. Um, I let off the game with a triple. Wow. Um, and what's interesting for, again, for baseball fans, particularly of that era, is um, Mark was slated to become the starting pitcher for the American League in the all-star game that was coming up in a couple of days. Wow. And so uh, I let off the game with a triple. Um, the batter behind me, um, you know, knocked me in. So we started off the game one up. And that in the fifth inning, it was about the fifth or sixth inning, Mark hurt his, hurt his arm. Uh, something tweaked in his elbow. And that was actually the last game he pitched with a healthy arm. Wow. He did go ahead and start in the American League, um, you know, American League started in the All-Star game, but he never pitched with a healthy arm after that. How crazy is that? And it's interesting how baseball fans, it creates, I mean, the timeline, you know, these moments in time. It's really interesting how baseball actually is a chronicle of, you know, of time and history and all that kind of stuff. Because, yeah, I remember, you know, those um, those players and – you know, my dad was really into baseball. Of course, we were Detroit Tigers fans. Mm -hmm. And of course, we got something in 1984 that we were pretty happy about. Yes. Um, but 
but it's so great to, to have you here. Well, let me let me ask you this question as we kind of jump into things. You know, I, I mentioned that this was a lifetime ago. Do you mind commenting on that? Because I've come to know you. And, and actually, let me tell that story first, and then we'll get into this. So Brandon from Rags to Riches decides he's going to come in with Hexray Vision to travel around Texas in a Winnebago and do these meetups for... And this is prior to us launching the Texan token. And so he wanted to come in and basically have these meetings with the TNM and, and, and bring people out. Well, I had met your friend Carter and Carter actually knows tank crypto. That's an interesting story there too. And I just invited, I was like, Carter, Hey, come, come see us. We're going to be in Dallas. I know you're up there. And he brought you, I had no idea that you were coming to this meetup and you didn't know a single thing about what we were doing with crypto or anything like that. But folks, this is really interesting because, you know, a lot of people operate as if this kind of stuff doesn't happen. And if you've been watching Crypto Heartbeat for very long, you know that I recognize that there are supernatural things that happen in life. And my in my life of the last at least 23 years, um, I've come to recognize that um, if you listen carefully, you're going to hear some really interesting things. And so... Carter, I'm saying hello to Carter, and he introduced me to this guy, Steve Staggs. And I'm like, oh, hey, Steve. And here's the crazy thing. As soon as I heard your voice, Steve, in the back of my mind, the Lord said to me, listen to this guy. And that doesn't happen. Like, I don't meet people and like, I, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I was like drawn to you. And then here's what's really crazy. And I don't know how to put my hand on it. You probably don't know this either. But the way you speak and the way you spoke to me and your vocal intonation. And I literally said to myself in the back of my mind, I said, is this an angel? <laughs> and what's funny about that is what I've learned from you since and what we've talked about related to angels, that's kind of offensive to be completely honest with you. <laughs> so, but I just want you to know, I hold you in high regard. I appreciate all that you've done for me, but Steve has become a mentor of mine and he's taken so much time, you know, to, to sit and listen to my buffoonery, but also examine, um, this, this life, um, our, our faith, and really challenging me with, I think, some of the greatest questions that were ever asked. And so that's what we're going to be getting into in this series, is we're going to be talking about this world and how it's upside down, and potentially, what, is, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus speak and say himself about how we, are right, how we get it right side up, and who we are in him, and all those things? So this is going to be a really interesting, um, really interesting thing. But I want you to give a picture of why when you had that wonderful mustache and we're a fan favorite, and I'm sure the ladies were all around the pro baseball player with his, you know, handsome, handsome man. Why was that in your mind a lifetime ago? And what has kind of transpired since? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Um, my, my grandmother used to tell the story that, um, the first time she asked me what I wanted to, to be when I grew up, um, I told her I wanted to be a baseball player. Um, she said I was about two and a half years old. <laughs> so that was something that was in me from a very, very young age before I even probably understood what it meant when she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I just knew that that was something that was in me that I wanted wanted to do. So my entire life um, was geared around accomplishing that. Um, as I grew a little bit older, <clears throat> um, my specific uh, dream was to replace Maury Wills as the as the shortstop for uh, for the Dodgers, and so. Um, you know, I would sit every night with my dad. You know, you were talking about your dad earlier. I would sit every night with my dad. We'd have the radio on. We'd watch, uh, I listen, excuse me, not watch, but we'd listen to the games. Uh, we'd listen to Vin Scully and Jerry Doggett were the, were the commentators. And, you know, Vin Scully, for those who remember that, that time, he was the best play-by-play um, -play guy that, uh, at least in baseball, 
And so I grew up with this, with this um, tremendous dream to one day play in the major leagues and hopefully, you know, replace Maury Wills. Um, in those days, you only had, you only had two, there was only one set of games that were televised and that's when the Dodgers played uh, the Giants in San Francisco. And so uh, to give you an idea of what uh, a dream actually looks like inside of somebody, um, I would watch those games again with my dad and then I would go out in the backyard and I would play entire nine inning games all by myself, emulating every single player. I could mimic every pitcher, every hitter on both sides of the field, and I would play entire nine inning games. Now, of course, the Dodgers won all the games, but occasionally I'd let, you know, the Giants sneak one in because you know, Juan Marshall was on the mound and, you know, and Willie Mays knocked one out and Cricket, you know, came behind him and not. So you get the idea. Well, the reason why I, I share that and the significance of it is that particularly in my baseball days, um, parents would come up to me and say, um, hey, Steve, um, would you mind taking a look at my son and tell me if you think he has major league potential? So I'd go out and I'd, you know, watch him play or take him to the batting cages or watch if he was a pitcher, watch him pitch and things of that nature. And so they always expected me to come back and, and talk about how strong his arm was or how fast he was or how great he could hit. And I would always ask them instead, tell me what he does when nobody's watching. Hmm. When nobody else is around, tell me what he's doing. Invariably, they will look at me like, what in, What kind of question is that? I just want to know if my son can, can play professional baseball. And I would tell them that if the dream isn't born from within, if it doesn't reside in him as part of his DNA, then he won't make it because it's not the physical capability that enables you to play. It's the mental fortitude and the attitude of perseverance that's in it. Wow. And if he doesn't have that, um, he's going to burn out in about a half a season. And so, you know, that kind of gives you a sense of the, you know, the background to actually wanting to play. But then when I finally got to the major league, something that was very, very interesting is I remember being in, um, in Anaheim and Anaheim was a fairly new stadium at that time, you know, um, Nolan Ryan and Frank Tanana were, you know, were the, the big pitchers in those days. Um, and I'm doing my pregame. I, I shared with you a little earlier how I handle my pregame stuff. So I was doing my pregame stuff and I was running back and forth, you know, getting, you know, loose. And I'm standing out in center field after one of my, my sprints. And I'm looking around at this gorgeous, brand new, beautiful stadium something I had dreamt about my entire life. And I looked around and I said, is this it? Yeah. Is this all there is? I spent my entire life dreaming to do this. And I was really perplexed. And I thought, oh, well, Ryan back, you know, <laughs> got in the game and off we went, right? Yeah. Um, then in about uh, mid-season in 77, between the 77 78 season. And I pro this is probably an important part of the story is um, you lose track of time. When you play professional sports, particular baseball, uh, baseball is like the chess of, of sports. Uh, it's not geared around high activity, has bursts of activity, but there's a tremendous amount of strategic interplay that occurs. And um, and so when you're when you're playing, um, each game is a little encapsulation of of life, and so you lose track of the normal pace of time that that most people um, live by. And so, really, the only 
the only time, the you know, time for you is broken into seasons. There's the season, there's the off season, there's, you know, um, spring training, then the season starts off again. So that's the macro way that you view time. And then inside of that, there's the first and the 15th when you get paid. And those are the only times, you know, yeah. Right. And so now in the mid season of between, um, uh, just getting ready to go into spring training in 77, 78. Um, the Lord makes me an offer and asks me if, I, if I'd be interested in, in, in going for him to, to do certain things with him and on behalf of him. And I thought, whoa, that's, a, that's an interesting kind of thing. But it so impacted me from the inside out that from that moment on, my life changed. That was the turning point in my life. Um, and then I'll I'll finish it. I'll finish it with this, Matt. Um, so when he when he said yes, I said, "Man, I'm in. I'll do that. That sounds really cool." Now I wasn't. I had grown up in you know in a church environment, but I was not a churchy you know, religious guy. As a matter of fact, I, I was a pretty perverse dude, man. I, you know, I, I, I lived it and I lived it good. Okay. Um, which is fascinating because the Lord did not take into consideration my lifestyle or attitudes at that moment. Hmm. It's not what I was doing that he came after. It was who I was that he came after. Wow. And so I said, yeah, let's do that. Let's go ahead and, and do that. Well, within about a year, I'm out of the game. And I could play. You know, I mean, I was at the, in, in the prime of my career, so I still had some pretty serious skills going on. Um, but that was the change. A um, little time later, I find myself in this kind of crossroads, uh, literal crossroads where I was in a Y. And on the right side of the Y, there was a path, and I could see my baseball career. Clear as I'm looking at you on the screen. On the other side, I could see this path, and it was clear. It was blocked by, by a veil of fog. I could not see past my nose. That's how dense the fog was. And so Jesus says to me, he says, uh, hey, I've given you your dream as a boy, which he had done, and I've also shown you that I've got a plan for your life, which do you choose? Huh. And Matt, I had no, I have no idea how did this, how this came out of me, but my answer was not a choice of path. I said, Lord, wherever you are, that's where I want to be. Wow. Now I have no idea how that came out of me, but that's the thing he was after in me. Say, hey, Steve, what do you really want to do with your life? I've given you the life. I've given you what you've asked for. You see what it's all about. Okay? But I've also shown you something else, that I've got a path. Now, that path, you don't get to see what's going down that path. That path is where we hang out, see? And you do not have the capacity to understand what's going on that path. Yep. That's my path. That's why I created you. Is that the path you want to go down? And so, once again, I didn't choose a path. I chose him. Mm. And when I chose him, about two weeks later, I was out of the game. And wow. here we are. <laughs> a lifetime ago. A lifetime ago. That's fantastic. Well, a lot has happened since, what, what year was that, 78? That, uh, that actually was 1979 was when I, when I got out of the game. Yeah. Okay, 1979. Wow. Well, Folks, this is Steve Staggs, right? We, we, you know, I got introduced to him and I heard this baseball story, but that's not the real story that we're about to talk about. That's the background of what's happening. But I, I, what I recognize in that, Steve, is that one thing you said and Carter mentioned here in the, um, in the chat, Carter said, what DNA dream has God placed in you? And I think what's really cool is this idea of like, when we think in terms of the science of DNA is that, hold on. So my DNA is different and it's unique and it functions and works and it informs all of these things. And here you're basically saying, Hey, 
And I love that you're teeing this up with choice, that there is a fork in the road. There's a why. And the question is, and I love what you said, that I didn't choose a path. I chose him. And I think for a lot of people that are looking at spiritual things or Christianity or the, what they've been taught or what they've been told, what I've come to learn is there's a lot of noise there's a lot of resistance and there's a lot of distraction um, almost to the point. Well, from what you know, I've had this conversation where a lot of times it's the opposite of what it should be. And so I want to share with folks and I want to kind of guide this perspective because Steve and I have visited for quite some time now and we, we tend to spend a lot of time on the phone and I just so appreciate it because you're willing to, to just give me your time. And, you know, I just appreciate it because it's hard, you know, you get to a certain point where you're doing a lot of different things and you got a lot of things going on in life and that somebody would just pause and say, and give to you. And so we talk about on this channel, a lot of times this idea of breathing life into people and this idea of, do we care for one another? And that the essence of community is about considering other people, not saying that you're nothing, but no, just consider other people in addition to yourself in this, this idea of David Lee coming to my dad's funeral or whatever it may be is there are these things that we, we're not like, cause I don't feel like when we visit, like you're worn out. <laughs> I feel like it's, 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 it's mutually beneficial in the sense that it's a joy. Yeah. And so I want to start, I want to start here. We're going to get into the meat and potatoes here and I want you to, I'm going to ask Steve a bunch of questions and I really want you to listen to him because what he's saying I'll condense at the end and we'll put a kind of bow on this thing. But I want you to listen really carefully because this is, this stuff has really, um, it's really helped me. It's almost like get things into better focus. It's to see a new facet of this, this, this gem and to re recognize that, hold on a second. I've been believing a lie and it goes back to the very beginning of all of this. So I want to I want to touch on two things. Um, the first thing I want to share, and let me uh, stop sharing my screen here. So I want to share with you guys. Um, we'll start with Matthew four four, and this is one of the things I think the first thing for me when we had our conversation that really really challenged my thinking. And I want to really examine all the edges of this one with you. So let me present this uh, screen. So, folks, this is, uh, and you've probably heard this story before. Jesus is in the wilderness, right? He comes out of the wilderness. Let's, let's just take a look at this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, so here's Jesus. He's hungry. He says, if you are the Son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. And what is Jesus' answer to this? And this is one of three temptations. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Steve, when you shared this with me, and of course everything seems to have built on top of this, this concept of every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Can you kind of talk about the significance of that and just your thoughts there? And then I want to go back to the garden. So let's, I'll just tee you up with that. Sure. Um, I'll probably set a little bit of the stage for this in talking about um, how we are taught to think. Yep. Um, because from the time we are born, we don't, we don't, end up on the planet with a PhD, you know, we, unless pooping diapers is, you know, yeah. qualifies for that. Right. But we, we come in as a blank slate and then we are trained in a particular way. And one of the ways we are trained is in how to think. Um, what's fascinating about how we are trained to think, we are trained to think independently while referring to others for our source. So if you see um, 
articles written, you know, technical papers written or things, what do they have? They always have identifying, you know, what the source of that comment is. Yep. So we are always taught, we're taught how to refer to others on a horizontal level. But if you, th but if you think about listening to Jesus, all of a sudden that's really weird. Yeah. How, how is it that it's, it's okay to listen horizontally but the idea of listening, listening vertically, all of a sudden, that's very weird. Or if you listen, if you say, I'm, an, I'm listening to what God is saying, what you're referring to, what you're taught to refer to most of the time is referring to the Bible. So it's still you're referring to a document. Yeah. And the document is what's telling you what God is saying. Well, that isn't what Jesus said at all. When he responded to, to the devil, he made it very clear that man lives on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And what's interesting about that, he gives you kind of a double whammy of what he's saying, because he uses a word, the word, the word, the English word word is actually the word rhema in the Greek, which is a spoken word. It's the word that produces statements. It's the word that produces commands. It's the word that in, produces instruction. Um, and then he says, out of the mouth of God. Well, how is it that we are speaking? When words come out of our mouth, how does that happen? See, when words come out of our mouth, we're talking with one another. So what Jesus is talking about there is that this is how we are designed to work and to function. We are designed to function. Yeah, bread, food takes care of the physical body. That is the machine that we've been given to carry out our mission and mandate on the planet. But then how is that actually accomplished? It's accomplished through this dialogue of conversation that happens between us and God. And it's out of that dialogue that man begins to live and express his life as it was designed before time began. <clears throat> and that's, how, and that's yeah. what he's talking about. Well, what's amazing to me, and this is, you know, we're kind of starting with the end in mind, right? And so we, we literally start with this idea that, hold on a second, Jesus himself, when tempted by the adversary in this case, who had this power over the world, right, that had this ability to give him, you know, authority or give him these things, he, he rejects it, and he says, no, 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 man does not live. He corrects him and says, no. And so I think what's really fascinating about this is this sets the stage for something I think is mind-numbing to me. So for the last 23 years, folks, I don't know if you know this, but I've studied the Bible. I have literally, I was transformed, had weight lifted off my back, and I saw that, hold on a second, just like Steve's saying, he's like, hey, I'm going to follow this guy. Well, ever. Ever since I decided I'm going to listen to Jesus, I start getting, um, there's implications to it. And the implications are extremely profound. And it very changed a lot of the nature. It's like he gave us a new name. And we literally were like, hold on, I've got different thoughts, different ideas, different direction. And I think, I think differently, right? So there's this new creation that's created. And so I'm starving for understanding who he is, right? Well, one of the things that we talked about at the very beginning, and I want to go back to, because I wanted to say, hey, Jesus is saying, man does not live on bread alone, but out of every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay. The spiritual, the physical. Now let's go back to the, the original, you know, the beginning, right? And I want you to kind of speak to this, because you asked me this question, and it like broke my brain. You said to me, did God know that the serpent was in the garden? And of course, we'll talk about that story. What did you, I mean, this just literally took my head and went, <laughs> broke it open. Um, because that's a tough one to challenge with. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, the bridge that I'll um, build between the temptation uh, of Jesus in the wilderness and the temptation of uh, Eve, Adam and Eve in the garden. The bridge between them is what I'll call 
um, strategic intent. Okay. Once again, we're taught to think more from an event orientation standpoint. We think in terms of events. So we look at the, at the Bible, for example, from any, uh, in terms of an event. So the event of Jesus being tempted by, by the devil, and this is what Jesus is doing, and we come up with all kinds of um, conclusions about what that exchange was all about. But it's all from an event orientation standpoint. It's not from a strategic standpoint. Okay, it says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. So Jesus was sent there by design. Okay, okay, Father, what was your strategic intention in leading Jesus into the end of the wilderness? Okay, Jesus, when you were engaged with the, with the devil, what was the authority that the devil was granted in that exchange? And then Jesus, how did you deal with the devil strategically? What was it that was going on there from a strategic standpoint that gave meaning to the exchange? Okay. Mm -hmm. So take that same concept and put it into the garden. So when Matt and I were talking, as you'll recall, <clears throat> um, we have a certain way that we've been taught that happened in the garden. And it's almost like this whole thing happened because man was dastardly. And so he was, he set out to disrupt God's plan. Well, we call it the fall. Yep. Well, okay. Let's ask a question in this man lives by every word. that um, Jesus, what was going on there? Did this catch you off guard? And so what he did is he pointed me to, and you'll remember this, he pointed me to the angels who were set outside with their flaming swords, remember? Yep. And he focused my attention right on that. And you know what question came to my mind? Well, if you could put angels with flaming swords after Adam and Eve did their deed to expel them and to keep them from entering the garden, why couldn't you have done that before the event happened to keep the, the devil, keep Satan out of infiltrating through the serpent, kept the serpent out? Why couldn't you do it then? Ah, good question, Steve. So, so let me stop you there. Folks, for those of you that are listening and you've got ears to hear this, this is really, really big and important for me because this was a profound question. And I want to just restate it in a, in, a, in a different way. We accept that God is omniscient, omnipresent. He knows all things. He's infinite intelligence. He's outside of space and time, right? Those of us who believe are like, okay, there is one that created it all. We are inside of this. He's in it and outside of he's everywhere. And we understand that he has all power and all dominion and all authority over all things. And we, we, we confess that. And I think a lot of people, believers, would say, yes, he knows all. But when you ask this question, it's like this question's always been there, but no one's really asked it. You have all of this power and all this knowledge and all of this understanding. You have this ability to keep them out with flaming swords and angels at the gate. Why did you do this? Why did you let that one in? And that's where... I think this whole story sits, and it's it's one of these things, folks, if you've been in the church and you've kind of learned the churchy ways, this is going to wreck you because it's a question that it demands an answer, right? Why? Why would you do it this way? So keep going, Steve. Yeah. So to us, again, in our event orientation um, training, the most important questions to us typically are what and how. What happened? How do we fix it? Um, what's going on? How do we, what are, what are the what and hows are what m are most important to us. But the most important question uh, to Jesus is why? Yeah. 
because the why is what gives meaning and purpose to the what and hows. And it's that why that has to be insulated and cut off in order to keep us in this event orientation mindset. So now you go back to, um, back to this, well, okay, if you, could, if you could keep man out of the garden, why couldn't you keep Satan out of the garden who then used the serpent the animal class serpent, the serving class serpent, to then, in, you know, execute his plan. And then the next thing that the Lord took me to, as we, through this questioning of why, the next thing he focused me on was his statement to Adam when he told him about not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. evil. And the definitions are much more profound than the translation allows, but because most people are familiar with the translation, it says, um, Jehovah spoke back and said, in the day you eat, you will surely die. Well, guess what? He didn't say, if you eat, there is no if element in that exchange. He said, in the day you eat you will surely die. So when you look at that, it's like, wow, this thing was intended and planned out right from the beginning. Again, the why. Okay. Okay, Lord. Then why did, if this, if this was not an if, but an inevitable outcome, then what was the, st the strategic importance of that exchange? And here was his answer. Up to that point in time, man only knew good. That's all he knew. But I created him to rule with me. And to rule, you must exercise choice. You must be able to discern between what is the right answer and what is the right, wrong answer. What is true and what is false. Okay. Up to that point, man did not, man only knew what was good. He did not know what was evil until he partook of the tree. And at that point, he understood both what was good and what was evil at that point. And this course brings up thousands of questions because I think the way that I understood things and heard as a, a kid about what is the story about? And I think a lot of people would say, um, you're just, uh, you, you, you chose unwisely. You are corrupt and broken and, um, almost, you know, this judgment of God and what you're, you're saying, which resonates so dramatically with, with everything that I, I read that follows this, this, this big question is this idea that if in fact God knew that the serpent was in the garden, that his plan was that we would be like him. And so we hear in the beginning that the Elohim or God in this the plural sense creates man in his image. And what is so amazing about this is this idea that, hold on, we're image bearers of him and being like him. When we hear what the serpent lied about, he said, surely he didn't say that. You will not die. But this idea that if you eat of this, you will have the knowledge of both good and evil. And what's amazing about, about that is we treat that, and I feel like I've learned in the church that that's this um, destructive force of corruption, and it's turned me into this, um, this, this devil himself. And what this question that you're asking, and as I examine it, and I ask Jesus myself about this, what resonates with me is, hold on a second, and this is what I hear the Lord say to me all the time, I love you, you're my son, trust me, and I'll show you. That's what I hear him say to me all the time. Yeah. 
And what's amazing about this is I, I, it, it, it like brings up all of these stories from the Bible. And it's like, hold on, every story that he told after that is basically a commentary on this one, which is, hold on a second. No, 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 you're a son. Even in the midst of eating the, the, the pig's food, as you come back and hope that I can, you can be a servant of mine, I run out to meet you. I put a robe on your shoulders and a ring on your finger, and I hug your neck. We, fill, we kill the fattened calf, and we celebrate that my son who is dead is now alive. And what's amazing about that to me is that this idea that, well, hold on, there is a purpose for us, because there is a directive that God gave when he kicked us out. And, and can you speak to that? You know, there's this, it's something that I feel like no one's talking about. It's very clearly defined in that story of the garden and of the quote unquote fall that in a way is the purpose of why we're here on this planet, according to that story. So what do you say and what do you think that God is saying about why we're actually here having a conversation on YouTube from that story of the garden. What, what, what are we here for? Well, that if you look at the, at the whole creation story and um, the, the first thing I'll, I'll share is that, and, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to kind of back and forth to give some, some context here, you know, for the answer is that when near the end of the creative story, there is this little statement that says, uh, and, and God completed his work and, um, and all the hosts there are thereof, okay? So God completed the creation of heaven and earth and, the, and all the hosts thereof. And he looked at it and said it was good and very good, okay? Well, what's interesting about, about that is if when most of us look at hosts, we think of that in terms of all the stuff maybe, all the planetary things of that nature. And so it's a pretty majestic sounding word, but it has nothing to do with what the original word that it's translating is. That word, the word that is translated host is actually the word for armies prepared for war. Huh. So it says, and God finished and completed um, the creation of all of his armies prepared for war. Wow. And so that is a, that is a, seems to me is a pretty significant kind of thing. <laughs> you know? Oh, so God, before you rested on the seventh day, you made sure that you had built, created, positioned, your army prepared for war from the very beginning. Wow. What exact, what kind of war were you actually looking for? Huh. See, what were you expecting to have happen? Now, this all goes into the concept of choice, by the way. See, um, so now let's go back and say, with, again, with the strategic thinking part of this. So, God, why would you, what was the strategic purpose for you building an army from the very beginning that not only was able to defend what you were building, but to enforce the decrees that you were issuing before time began? What was it that you were expecting? Okay, now let's go back to the creative part of man. So, and, and I don't know if you want to get into this at some point, you mentioned it earlier, um, but the words that we are used to, to reading is in the beginning, God, singular, created the heavens and the earth. But the word God is not, that's an aberration. That's not what that says. 
the word is Elohim and Elohim is plural. Yeah. So if we were to put the God word on top of that, you know, um, it would actually read in the chief beginning of time, order and rank, the Elohim created, shaped and formed his heavens and his earth. So there is this class of being, this plural class of being called Elohim that actually engaged the process of creating. Okay, so why is that significant? Because when the Elohim, when it came for the Elohim to create man, the Elohim, and this is the language, so I'm not, anybody could go in there and look exactly what it says. And what it says is, and the Elohim said to the Elohim, Elohim, rule, subdue, multiply, etc., etc. So the Elohim called man Elohim. Well, what are Elohim? Well, the translators call tag, put the God tag on it, and I would submit to you that that is a, that is a defensive tactic that we can get it in another time. But the point yep. is that man is now called Elohim as well. Huh. Well, okay, Jesus, what are Elohim in your, in your domain? Well, Steve, they are my rulers. They're the ones who are called to rule with me. I have Elohim in heavens. I have Elohim in earth and man is my Elohim on the earth. They are charged with ruling. Now, their choice, one cannot rule without choice. One must have the prerogative of choice in order to rule. And here is the first choice that my Elohim man must make, whether he will rule with me or whether he will rule on his own uh. or from me. Ah, now we see the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yep. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil proposes to us that it gives us the capacity to rule, to determine what is good, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, what is good for me, what is not good for me, what is in my best interest or not in my best interest on my own. And that's what man is then given the opportunity to do. Every one of us. Yeah. And it continued what what was the choice that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden? That's the choice we ha- we exercise every single day. Now we're going back to Jesus in the in the temptation, and Jesus says, "No, I don't exercise choice independently. Mm. I do only what comes from my Father's mouth. Whatever I hear Him say, that is what I do." Wow. So I'm going to throw a bunch of stuff out here. <laughs> this is so big, Steve. So, okay. folks, you know, when you think about theology, and a lot of people have thought about these things, right? There's a lot of commentary around this. You know, Steve isn't the first guy to ask this question. Why is this word plural? Why did you translate it as singular? Why? And so there are a lot of people who would say, well, this is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity. But then there's more to this story. And I no. think that one of the great things about asking questions. God's okay with these questions, right? We can ask these questions. What I think is really cool, and and folks, I want one of the reasons that I just love Steve so much is the fact that he's he's challenged me, and I've asked a lot of these questions. And and you know what your answer to me every time is? You always say to me, what's Jesus saying to you? Yeah, go ask him. Ask him. Ask him. So here's the thing that I think is really fascinating about this story. So I'm going to kind of... Put all this in a in in crypto heartbeat vernacular. Yeah. So in the beginning, there's creation and it's good. And in this creation, it it's clearly more than we think. Yeah. There's more to it than we think. So I'm just gonna put that kind of term on it. That hold on, I don't completely understand all of it. But I know that we've translated as much more simplified. And I think we've been taught in church or taught that, you know, just, hey, just go with it. But what's so amazing about the scriptures and what's amazing about this concept of saying 
most people have not realized. I, I almost feel like everything I see within the church over the last 2,000 years plus is that there's always some middleman. And when I look at crypto and I look at centralization and I look at how this world gets corrupted and I see how people establish power and how they rule over people and exercise this authority, it's by getting in between stuff. And one of the things that's so big here, folks, and I want to challenge you with, is that a lot of the things that we've learned, and it could be, how did my dad treat me when I was a kid? I learned something about what a father is from my alcoholic hippie dad, right? That may not be who God is, right? He's not just a version of my dad who drank too much and was a hippie. And I can tell you wonderful things about my father. So that's a learning that I have about who, what is a father and who is he? But then there's also this idea of who is God the Father? Who is this one who created all things? And I'm just going to submit that it's bigger than you can possibly fathom or articulate. And there's a term in here that makes our heads go, hold on a second, the Elohim, this plural group that created. Now, I think when we want to keep things really tidy, we'll say, well, that's the Trinity. Fine. The, it makes a much, much bigger point to me in what you're saying. And what you're saying is, I knew what I was doing when I created. Nothing caught me off guard. Yeah. The serpent was not, you have to understand this, in that actual statement at the beginning, it says he was the most crafty of all the animals the Lord God had made. And I think what's really interesting is when you think about this idea that nothing exists that wasn't created by him. And so when we see as the Elohim and Jesus, you know, they use all kinds of conventions to describe who he is. He's in the line of Melchizedek. He is the high priest. He is the firstborn among many. He's the son of God. And we've got this this rank or authority of who Jesus is. He's the boss, right? If you keep it really simple, he's the boss. But then he also says things like, without me, you can do nothing. I am the vine and you are the branches. That there's, If there's not connective tissue, nothing you can do. And so when I think about this term, then clearly, if you systematically look at it, that, hey, if we're separated from this thing, we've got very little power. We have very little insight. We have very little direction. And what you've described in all of this, which I think is on one hand super complex, but then super simple on the other hand, is you have a choice. And in order for you to be my son, in order for you to rule on this earth, you have to know the difference between good and evil. So the big mind-numbing story that goes against what I've heard in the past, it's really that it's not that I was trying to be deceived or somebody was trying to deceive me. It was like it was overlooked. And it's this idea that you actually have a role to play in this story. And when I reflect on what's my, what's my role, Steve? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, why did he make me different than you or someone else? Why am I going through these things that I'm going through? Why did I kill the lion and the bear? You know, all of these different stories that have been told. And what really is stuck out to me in this whole story is that to say it was his intent all along for you to be like him. And I think that that story within the church has basically said to me that you're, something went wrong. It's, it snuck up on God and surprised him. And I would challenge you, I think, you know, and I've asked Jesus myself about this, this idea, no, who are we in you, Lord? Who are we in you? And it, it's almost like God smiles and says, yep, yep, you're getting it. You're understanding. You're not a servant. You're not an animal. You're a son. You're an heir. You're one who I have created for these good works. But to be in my family and to be like me and to be a son who wears a ring and a robe, you have to rule. You have to make choices. And what's really interesting is we see this manifest in our daily lives. We know 
when we're doing the things we shouldn't be doing. And it's really interesting to me that it's reflected in the difference between us and the animals. And what I see every single day is the same exact thing that he did when he spoke the world into existence. He's allowing us to do here. And so, folks, in crypto, this is crypto heartbeat. You're like, how does this fit into crypto, man? When Lambo? What I think is really fascinating is we're seeing this repeat itself. And it's, it's, it's a picture of how the system is structured and created. And when we understand how we fit into it and what our actual role is, we see that he gave us this ability, this power, this dominion to speak things into existence according to his will. And one of the things I think is amazing, Steve, and I'd love for you to talk about this as it relates to crypto, is you talk about tools. And you say, you can animate a tool because you have choice. So I could take a hammer and I could hang a picture on my wall, or I could bludgeon you to death with it. So I'm going to animate this hammer to put a nice picture on the wall, or I'm going to use this hammer to destroy you. And we animate these tools. Well, you said to me, and I, I believe it fundamentally, that the blockchain, the Web3, the immutable contracts on the blockchain, Hex and its T-shares and all of these things is a tool and a gift that we've been given to use and to animate in a certain way. What do you say about that as it relates to folks in crypto and what we have before us? Because I feel like he started in a garden, and then when I read Revelation 21 22, I'm like, it finishes in a city. Well, it actually grows over time. And here we have been given this new gift, and this new gift of this decentralized blockchain that takes out the middleman. And by the way, folks, if you haven't caught it yet, there is one that is trying to devour us. We have an adversary who's trying to get in the middle and when I see this, I go, hold on, we could animate this in a way where we exercise our God-given rulership and authority to speak something into existence that actually is aligned with his creation. And what comes from that and what is the evidence of his creation but abundance? What do you say to all that? Do I am I am I catching your drift, man? <sighs> Well, I, as is all of our conversations, you know, but um, what we can do is introduce folks to it. But if you really want to get into it, you have to have that conversation with the good Lord to say, OK, yeah. what, what is it that you act? How do you see this? I'm starting to get a glimpse, but how is it that you actually see this? So now let's go back to um, back to the beginning of it. Um there are probably you're a business guy. There are a lot of business guys probably on the yeah. on the on the chat and on the the stream. And anybody in business knows that if you're going to put effort into something, there has to be an outcome that you're that you are targeting. Yeah, a plan. Okay. Well, and and what I would actually say, just a little slight deviation from that. The plan is the means by which the outcome is intended to be accomplished. Good so point. the plan is a su is subordinate to something greater than itself. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now we talk about the plan of God. Well, okay. The plan is subordinate. It's the means by which something is to be outcome to be accomplished. Okay. So. In a business context, we would say, here is my vision, here is my intention, here is my dream, whatever vocabulary you might use, but it is something that is distant out there yeah. that is worthy of you committing all that you have to accomplishing. And when you put all that you have to accomplishing it, you're putting all that you have at risk in order to accomplish it. Right. Right? Okay, right. so the question is, what is God's vision? Why did he create? What in the world was he doing? If heaven and earth were created by the Elohim, or let's even say by God singular himself, 
where was God hanging out at the time? Okay. So, see, these again are bigger questions. Well, and maybe at another at another uh, stream, we'll talk about that more specifically. But as it relates to your questions up to this point in time, if we do not know what God's vision was for us, both individually and collective as a species, then how in the world are we going to accomplish it? Wow. You know, it makes me think about your original story, right? So if you didn't, miss, if you missed this at the beginning, Steve talked about when he was a very, very small boy, he told his mom he wanted to be a baseball player. And I think there's such a neat story in that for what we're talking about is that there was something deep inside of you that almost you had no choice but to go out into the yard and to play nine innings of that game over again. And when you said to those, those young boys, what does he do when no one's watching? And when no one was watching you, you were playing nine innings of the game against you know the Dodgers, right? Yeah. I think what's so what a wonderful introduction to this whole concept, because we're going to be talking about this for weeks, is this idea that what is it in you? And it, you make this really great point. You've constantly asked me, you said, hey, what, what is, have you asked Jesus about this? What is he saying to you? And I think what's so great about this is there's so many people in this world that want to give you their vision for your life. They want to be in the middle and tell you what you should be doing. And what I love that's so liberating about this idea is, no, 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 no. He will, he will give you the desires and visions of your heart. He will actually show you. And what's really amazing to me about that is, the, you know, we, we talked at the very beginning when we met. I said, you know, the Lord has said to me, you're going to unlock global generosity by giving. And he gave me the feeding of the 5,000 is this picture that you need to offer everything you have. You need to give, and then you need to give, and then you need to give some more. And that in that process of loving and giving, it unlocks an abundance. Well, that's not, there's not, the whole plan isn't like spread out. Well, how do we do this? But the vision is out there. Well, I don't know how that works. And then I saw blockchain and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, hold on a second. This is a piece of it, right? And he's like, yes, this is a piece of it. Well, what should I do? And I feel like I'm fumbling around. I'm like, hey, Steve, come on my stream. Let's talk about this thing. It just shows to me how patient God is with us and how willing he is. It's okay for us to bump our heads against things. It's okay. Like That's the thing I feel like the church has said to me. If you're not doing it this way and you don't have it all buttoned up and you don't put on a show, but in reality, we actually let go of everything and become completely exposed. And we say, reform me, restore me. And here's the thing I will say to you. If you've never been somebody who actually asked that question of Jesus, you didn't literally go, why am I here? And it's so funny to me, Steve, the people that I see that have conversion experiences generally are at the end of themselves. And that was the truth for me. And I read all these stories of conversions throughout history, right? Way, way, way back is that people have gotten to this point where their choices and the things that they've done have gotten to the point where they're so worn out that their life has become unmanageable and they finally go, I got nothing. Yeah. And it's like all these people that I see who have, you can see they're working on their own power and their own strength and their own desires and they're going their own way are missing out on the richness of saying, no, 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 no. You think you know what your, your skills are. You think you know what your strengths are. You think you know what your abilities are. You have no idea how powerful you are. Yeah. And when you're willing to let go, he, it's, and, and so I want you to speak of this. This is a bit of a, like, I did not intend to do this, but I, I really feel led to do this. What does it mean when God gives someone a new name? Well, if, if you look at, I mean, it's, the, the scriptures are, are full of it. Um, Sarai, he named Sarah. Um, Abram, he renamed Abraham. Um, Jacob, he renamed um, Israel. And so what happens is you're actually getting into something um, about the authority that comes with naming rights. 
So when God gives us a new name, what he's giving us is he's giving us essentially the name that he that he gave us before time began. Okay. And in that name establishes relationship, authority, um, uh, and rank. Well, I'm pausing a little bit because all that we are in him is represented in our name. Mm. So that when he said to Mary, and his name shall be called Jesus. Guess what? We are told a little bit later that that is the highest name that has ever been given. And that one whose name is Jesus has all authority. So when you talk about a new name, what's happening is, is that we are coming into the full essence of all that God packed into us from before time began. Okay, now apply that a little bit to what God had done with Adam. What did he do with, with the animals? Let him name them. He brought all the animals and said, hey, wow. name these dudes. Wow. Because you, through the, through the authority that is vested in naming rights, you will have authority over everything that exists on the planet. Wow. Folks, you know what It just resonates in my ears, you Steve, name. is... New name. We have forgotten who we are. Yeah. And we've been lied to about who we are. And here's the thing, you know, what, what I love about this idea of naming rights and authority is that, you know, think about this. If you've got kids, I mean, I remember, I remember when I, my wife and I were like, hey, what are we going to name these things? And you think about what did they mean? And, and it meant something to us. We're like, okay, what are we going to call these children? And then we adopted a boy and the Lord said to me when it all happened, because it's the most amazing story of how we, we adopted him. He basically said to me, he's your golden boy. And his name is Gage. And my wife has a story around why his name is Gage. And, you know, you don't re recognize or relate to the fact that and when you've really like helped me see this how big it is that so many times in the scriptures people's names have even jesus changed people's names and you know i think saul and paul and it, it's like over and over again why are people's names and what you're really getting at which is so big is that i think people you can ask for a new name you can ask jesus for a new name and what, what is the promise in that is when you accept that new name, you accept his authority over your life. And here's the thing I've recognized. When we become aligned with the very nature and structure and system and framework of God's creation in its goodness, it's like, remember the old, um, remember being in chemistry class, like in high school, and they would have like those tinker toys and like you would build the molecules, right? And I, I think about carbon 60, you know, we are carbon based life forms. Carbon 60 is what's called a buckyball after Buckminster Fuller. And it's this soccer ball shaped molecule of carbon. And it was discovered at Rice University back in the 90s. And, you know, that's what this whole stuff about, um, uh, you know, all, all this, you know, carbon nanotubes and all this stuff. What's interesting to me is I feel like in my life before I had a new name, I'd be like, hey, I can hit a home run. I can run to first base faster than anyone else. I can do this or that. And I see this skill and I've got this ability. I can manipulate this situation. I can speak circles around these people. I can exercise this strength that I see in myself. And it's what's weird is like when he gave me a new name, he said, no, 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 you can connect two or three of these bonds, right? You can connect the, the baseball bond and you connect the speaking bond and you can connect this one. And those are satisfying. But if you really want me to encompass and envelop and connect all of these bonds in all of their 60 derivations or 60,000 derivations, that's where life is. 
that's where life is. And one of the things I think is amazing is this idea of conversion. We've, we've distilled everything down to this concept of salvation. And we've said it, it feels like a notch on the belt in the Baptist church. Like, we got another one. Put them on the rolls. And you told me a story about, about Paul in Macedonia. And you told me a really interesting story about, um, about the Lydia. Do you mind sharing that story? Sure. Um, Yes, and if I may, a little yeah, bit yeah, to connect yeah. from because I don't want to yeah. lose your one of your previous questions that yeah, please. some somebody in the audience might might be saying, okay, when are you going to answer that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 please. And we'll come back to Lydia just a little bit. Um, how can we fulfill our purpose if we don't know who we are? Yeah. Well, mankind, our role is to rule the planet. When you look at the words, um, and the Elohim said, Elohim, rule, subdue, multiply, exercise, dominion over everything. Doesn't matter if it's on the, if it's walking on the dirt, flying in the eye, in the sky, or swimming in the sea, you are to exercise rule over all of it. Okay? So that's what we are here to do. And we are to this very day, we exercise rule. The question is, how are we going to exercise rule? Mm. Are we going to exercise our rule on our own? That's what is illustrated through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yep. Are, we going to, are we going to look at data? Are we going to evaluate all the options? Are we going to do our SWOT analysis? Are we going to do all of these things and then decide on our own? That's what we're going to do? Well, we have the prerogative to do that. Or are we going to rule with Jesus? Hmm. That's the picture in the in the temptation exchange. Yeah. Where Jesus himself says, I do nothing apart from my father. See, the vine and branch concepts. We are exercising rule today. The question is, how are we exercising that rule? So now let's apply this to your crypto question. Okay. All tools are neutral. Yeah. See, they're neutral. They, the gun that sits on the table will sit there for a billion years if somebody doesn't come and animate it through its use, either, either for good or for evil. It's the same thing with crypto. It is a tool. See? It is a tool that offers tremendous advantage. But the choice that is given to us is how are you going to exercise that tool? How are you going to administer and manage how are you going to exercise the administration of that tool? Are you going to do it in the vocabulary of this discussion? Are you going to do it off the tree of knowledge of good and evil where you can decide on your own how to do it? Or are you going to learn to exercise the administration of that tool with me? Huh. The outcomes will be, will be very different based on that choice. And so that's the opportunity that's in front of Anyone who is given a new tool to administer. Wow. Well, let's call it creating or building yeah. or admin. That's and we're we've been doing it all along. Wow. And so and so here we are. So wow. now now to your question about Lydia. Mm. I think. Unless you want to just pause on that one. Yeah, I want to pause just for a second on that one because it's so big. And and it and it offers up this. So here here we are recognizing the fact that we have authority and we, and there's power, there's really truly power in him. We have our own source of power and sense of power and we can manipulate things and we can go our own way and we can make our own plans. But there's so much in the scriptures that says, well, yeah, you, you can make plans, but God determines the steps, right? Like he's got a, a role in this, but this idea of what if I consciously said, I want to do nothing apart from you. And this idea, I want to follow you. So many times I feel like, you know, well, I don't, I don't hear the voice of Jesus. But then when I think about it, hold on a second. When I stop and I and I rest in him, or I it's funny, like you've seen this a million times, and so have I. Ray and I get together pretty much every day, and I'll share with him something that I've read that morning. Right. And I it was, I think it was for 
Oh, is Isaiah Isaiah 55 uh, yesterday? And I said, oh, look at this. This is unbelievable. And I showed him, I said, look at this. It's, it's showing us this, this idea of an endowment. Well, he had read that earlier in the day, and he goes, no, 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 no. It's about this. This is what God is. And I think about that for a second. I say, so you're telling me that the same words on a page for two different people are giving us tremendous insight. Well, one, it shows the depth and breadth and you know amazing power of the words that come out of his mouth. But it's not the words that are sitting on a page. It's what Jesus is doing and God is doing through you to highlight that what you need for the day. Yes. And it's such a beautiful thing because I think a lot of people have gone through this life. They don't believe that there is any help or guidance because this is where I really want to go before Lydia. In the garden, there was a liar who lied to Eve and said, no, he surely didn't say that. And then there's the devil who's saying, hey, hey, you know, basically worship me. And there is one, there's an adversary. And there's one who is the ultimate middleman standing in the way of our crypto, right? The, the counterparty. And what's interesting about every story that's been told is there's always this antagonist. And before we get to Lydia, I want to just express this thing, that it seems to me that there's this battle, and it's between good and evil, and it really rests between the choices that we make in some respects. And we think about temptation, and we think about all these things. If Jesus is the firstborn, right, he is the Son of God, he's teaching us how to do it. Yeah. And it seems like every time he teaches us how to do it, he's saying, I'm making the choice to do nothing apart from every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And what does that practice look like? And I think that if you believe the lie that people are telling you, okay, World Economic Forum, science, you know, our reasoning, uh, scientific community, and I say this a lot, they want to tell you that we came from a single-celled organism, became a newt, and then became a chimpanzee, and now, poof, by accident, you're here. There's an alternative story, folks, that's true. This is whole no, 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 no. In, in, the, in the line of authority, we get our authority from the one who created it all. And I think what's so like super exciting is what if I was aligned with that? What if I chose that? What if every day that I wake up out of unconscious state, I were to say, hey, what do you want me to do today? Because then I think about them wandering in the wilderness, like a pillar of fire and, and smoke, and it's like he provided, and then there's like like manna and quail. Like, hold on a second. And then you couldn't store it, and, and every day it was there. Hold on, is this a God of abundance who provides for us every day? And then if we like align ourselves with that, he, he connects all these dots, and, and, and he gives us peace? The benefits, like what's amazing about this, this isn't one of these things where it's like, all right, let's go bleed out our eyes, you know, and you're, you're going to be just tortured the whole time. It's like, no, there's incentive tied into this. And it's like, there is a liar. There is someone who's saying to you constantly that you are someone you are not. You are less than you're not. And here's what's crazy, Steve, and I have to admit this. I feel like the church has told me that. You're just a disgusting, broken piece of beep, and that you have not. And it's almost like, no, no, no. And this whole, this whole conversation is about what does it mean to be right side up? Because it seems like the world is upside down and that there's those that are lying to us saying, you are not. And why would they lie to us? So that we don't follow every word that comes out of his mouth and that we aren't effective. And I feel like, you know, part of the reason we don't see the miracles that, that I think are like exuding from the Old Testament is the fact that we've become neutered, especially in the West. And it's almost become milk toast and lukewarm. But it's like, hold on, there is one that's constantly prowling around lying to us. And it's not just devouring us with a mouth of sharp teeth. 
But it's the little things that say, yeah, I'm just nobody. I sat with these this group of kids. I, I was doing, right when we were launching the Texan token, these five boys were in the a class, a crypto class with me. I was with them for five days. And the first day I asked them to put on a piece of paper the day they were born. On the left-hand side, put the day you were born. And these kids are 15, 16 years old. And I said, all right, on the far right of this page, put the day you're going to die. You got to pick it. And they're like, what? And I said, is that hard for you to do? And I said, I'll put today's date in the middle somewhere. And I asked these kids, and Steve, I could not believe it. Two of the boys out of the five in a Christian school in Central Texas said to me, yeah, I don't think I'll live past 40. You know, people, you know, there's so many people on this planet. I'll just, I'll just die and there'll be somebody else born. These are kids in Christian homes yeah. in Central Texas basically saying, my life is worthless. Who is the adversary and how is he lying to us? And, and why do we have to be on guard and understand that, hold on a second, there's way more to this story than we give credit for. We think that we're alone. What do you say to that? What? Who is this deceiver? And what is this that's going on? And is it real? Well, I believe it is, but what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Um, yeah, we could do it a whole stream on that one. I know, um, I know. Let's think about it like this for a second. Um, and we'll kind of tie a couple of concepts together, upside down, right side up, things okay. of that nature, okay? Um, in, in the kingdom of God, authority has the purpose of blessing and protecting. That's its reason for being created. That's the reason it exists. So if one possesses authority, Jesus has granted responsibility to someone to bless and protect whatever it is that has been put under his care. Could be his family, could be a business, could be a concept cryptocurrency, it could be anything, okay? Um, and so, and then he releases or grants power commensurate with that authority in order to achieve the mission the authority was given to mm -hmm. bless and protect. So now if you go uh, in the upside down world, authority is given so that you can command certain things, that you can do things that you want to do because you are the most high in that situation. So if you have the authority of, um, of being the owner of a business, you're the most high in that business and you can command whatever you want done. Everything must submit to you. Now, by the way, whether it blesses or blesses and protects or not, right. it's a, it's an issuance of your will. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are the two different ways that that is an example of authority in the upside down world and authority in the right side up world of the kingdom. Okay. So now let's apply that to crypto. What is the nature of the authority that you will exercise when administering crypto? Will that crypto has as its mission to bless and protect all that come under the umbrella of that mechanism? Huh. Or will it be used, see, to exploit, extract, to do other things to advance an individual agenda rather than to bless and protect. Wow. See, that's how, that's how the upside down, that's an example of these two worlds and how they, and how they function. Okay. So now let's go back to a little bit, use that as a, as a basis for going. Now let's go back to the garden. When man was created, he was given the authority to exercise dominion, okay? So how was he to exercise that dominion? He was to exercise it with the Elohim, with God, to bless and protect. 
that's how he was supposed to, to exercise that authority. And so when we exercise this authority, then if we are to rule, subdue, subjugate, exercise dominion, then what does that imply? That there will be those influences and entities that will attempt to do exactly the opposite, to exploit, to subjugate. Okay? So in the, in the command to rule, subdue, multiply, exercise dominion under the authority of the kingdom, it is to bless and protect against what? Those influences and activities that would do exactly the opposite. Uh, wow. Okay. So there is one who is out there to do exactly the opposite. See? He's not there. It's represented in the serpent in the garden. He's yeah. not there. See, to make sure that you're blessed and protect. That's what that was what he was originally designed to do. And we can get into that in a, maybe so, another discussion. So uh, that's the one. And it's a spiritual Element. Yeah, yeah, it's a well, spiritual component. Oh my gosh! So okay, I'm, I'm learning as we go here. So bear with me. <laughs> so what you're saying, which blows my mind, is here's here's Peter, right? Peter's been hanging out with the real dude, yep. like the boss, the man, <laughs> and he says to him, "Get behind me, Satan." Yes. Here's what's really fascinating. This just like dawned on me while you're while you're talking. You said we have a choice. We can go this way, our own way, or we can go his way. And here's this picture in the scriptures of Jesus himself telling one that has been with him, seen him, lived with him, that ultimately he said, hey, upon this rock, I will build this. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. I think what's really interesting is what we don't recognize is I think in our culture, we think that the devil has red spandex, a pitchfork, and flames behind him. And he's one. Yeah. Hang on a second, folks. When I go my own way, I am a form of evil. Even to the point where Peter the says, instrument. the instrument, thank you. That's actually, I'm the instrument of it, just as Peter was. And he said, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct, get in line, bro. What a powerful idea. So think about this for a second. I think we we illustrate this with Bond villains, right? The super Bond villain like Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. But if you see how this is so pervasive and in, in I feel like God gave me, reminded me of, of, of um, yeast and bread and the leavening, right? This idea that it is something that is so pervasive. It gets into the joints of a lot of things and that there are people, whether they recognize it or not, as they go their own way, they're actually being as used as instruments for the basically the upside down world. Yeah. And that Klaus Schwab and World Economic Forum and some of those people that are worshiping at the, the altar of climate change have the desires they want to do good, but they're going their own way. And what's end up happening is they're like, well, we need more control because these are just animals. These are just, you know, accidental animals. And we are the smart ones and they're the dumb ones. And whether they recognize it or not, they're being used as instruments of that, which is a lie and deception, because what is the outcome of their activity, but destruction and control aside from and apart from the words that come out of the mouth of Jesus himself. It's crazy. Like that's a, that's an epiphany for me. Well, and here, if I, if I may, and you know, these are conceptual, these are concepts that can, if that can be interesting, um, but they have very, very practical components to that. When you learn how to, to operate in them. And that is the, the dividing line is nature and character. Yeah. Okay. When, when the serpent approached Eve, one of the fascinating elements about that, and you mentioned it earlier that the serpent was the white wisest and most shrewd of all the animals created in the garden. Okay. Um, have you ever 
Has it ever struck you that Eve did not seem the slightest bit uh, put off that a serpent was talking to her? Right. It was like, dude, who are you? Yeah. You know, no, it's that was a normal part of the existence of the creation that this this serving class being you know we've talked about the elohim the angelic we haven't yet but at some point perhaps we'll yeah. talk about the three classes in god's creation the elohim which is a ruling class the angelic class which is the ministering class and then the animal class which is the serving class this animal the serpent whom god had vested with the authority to be shrewd and wise and very astute. This serving class being called a serpent at that time approached Eve and Eve thought nothing of it. Hmm. She engaged conversation with him like it was an everyday event, which it was. Now to her, and this is the nature of how deception works to her, this was a normal process that the serving class being who was there to serve her was, was providing her counsel and input about how to achieve a particular issue where she needed wisdom to be able to accomplish that. If the serpent exercises the authority under the kingdom of God with, with Jesus, then sound wisdom in other words, the way God thinks would have been transmitted because that was the authority granted. But in the upside down world, that serpent made an alliance with this spiritual being, see, that we now call Satan. And th that spiritual being became the agent to talk to her and used authority in the upside down world. For what reason? To subjugate her. See, to put her under, not to bless and protect, but to exploit and extract. Wow. And so, wow. guess what? That is what is happening every single day. That exchange is going on. And the way that you can tell um, in, the initial, in the initial learning processes that Jesus takes you through of which is what authority is at work is by the nature and character that resides inside that authority. When you talk about Charles Schwab and those folk, when you look at that, what nature and character do you observe? Do you observe a nature and character that is attempting to bless and protect? I think one of your, um, one of your, um, the chats earlier said, to set the captives free, mm -hmm. is that what it's intended to do? Or is it intended to exploit, to extract? Hmm. The nature and character will tell you. Or is it, on the other hand, to bless and protect? Let's liberate. Let's set free. Let's do things that allow man and his creation and the creation of God on earth to come into its fullness of the intention of God when he spoke it into existence, your words earlier. <sighs> which nature and character is at work. And then boom, oh my goodness. If that nature, if I can discern that nature and character in others, what nature and character is operating in me? Is it the nature and character of my creator or is it the nature and character of the serpent who's come in to exploit? Wow. Wow, wow is an understatement. So let me, let me share this because this is just, you just said it in its fullness. So this is John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus is saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And you know what's interesting about this and what really captures my heart with crypto and all of these things and we'll, as we kind of wrap this thing up here in the last 10 minutes, is this idea that there is a vision outside that's extended past. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I think it's really hard for a lot of people to 
sometimes with what they've gone through, even consider that they would deserve something better. You know, they feel like I've made so many mistakes. I've done so many things wrong that it's all piled up so high that it's hard for me to believe that one things could be different, but two that, um, that there's actually one who has created it all who cares about me and that would want me to live life in its fullness in this protective and blessing and all of these things. It's almost like the serpent has tried to stuff us back in the box, right? So to, to, and, you know, I think about, what 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 blesses me about this conversation and every single conversation we've ever had was that you've constantly I've challenged you on so many things and asked you about details of so many things and every single time you said to me ask him what he thinks and I think what's so great about this is folks we talk about in crypto about no middlemen censorship resistance you know, trustless yield. We talk about no admin keys, not your keys, not your coins. And what is such an interesting analogy is that knowing about Hex or knowing about Texan or knowing about crypto is not having T-shares. And there's something here that I feel like the, the church and, and people and religion has mechanized. And there is something that is supernatural here that is not between you and a priest and you and a building and you and a doorway and you and a steeple and you and a small group and you in a Bible study and you in Sunday school. But no, there's access to fullness in him right now. No. There's no barriers. There's no middlemen. There's no... And that's the thing to me that um, is incredible. Like, in, in it, what's interesting is how does our own choice, you know, I think we talk about the term of faith, right? I think about the woman who is bleeding and she's like, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And it says power went out of him and he was amazed by her faith. <laughs> right? Hold on a second. That's an action that she took, a choice she made. And she believed that if she touched the hem of his garment, that she'd be healed. And even, even the Son of God himself was amazed by her faith. And then I hear stories of the, the, the faith of a mustard seed or moving mountains or you're more than conquerors or you can do more than I did. Everything, when you look at it in this context, is that he wants to be king over our lives and give us this authority, but he wants us to rule. He wants us to exercise this, this choice of choosing him, but also experiencing this fullness. Like he doesn't want to give, we ask for something, he's not going to give us a snake. He wants to give us, he's a father who loves us. I mean, you know, it's amazing. It's like, I feel like, it resonates is so true because in some respects, when you understand that it's upside down, everybody's trying to get in the way. FTX, Celsius, all of these people want to get in between you and your crypto. Give me your keys. Give me your coins. And it's such a picture of this story of, hold on a second. No, 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 no. There's a responsibility when you hold your own keys. And the fact that they're called keys is so big. You hold the keys and you have the choice. You can go your own way or you can choose to say, no, 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 I'm going to align myself with the, the one who created it all, who wants to offer direction and wants to offer guidance and wants to offer wisdom, but said, I'm going to, I'm going to stand a bit at a distance to let you decide because that's who I created you to be. And that's just like, you know, everybody's like, what's the meaning of life? Like, this is the essence of the meaning of the purpose of all of the reasons that we're here. Anyway, I'm just articulating my, my mind-numbing amazement with it all. 
Well, here's a, the, the simplicity of it all. Yeah, yeah. Is that in the upside down world, there is a compulsion, a drive to rule over others. Yeah, yeah. In the right side up world, the first act of ruling is over your, over your person. Yeah, yeah. What choice am I going to make about how I'm going to rule not only my own life, then, but from out of the rule of my life outward to the rule of all things that are entrusted to me? And that first choice exists here. See, when we go back into the garden, the first man chose to exercise his rule to his benefit or what he thought was his benefit. Well, okay. That's a prerogative of choice. And through that exercise of choice, we have learned that's the mechanism that God um, uh, implemented or designed to build us into his nature and character. What did the last Adam Jesus do? I do nothing apart from my father. Hmm. Jesus, just show us the father and it's enough. Right. Look, dude. We've been hanging together all these years. If you see me, you see the Father. How is it that you say, show us the Father? We are one. Wow. Well, guess what? Jesus is the firstborn of many sons, many children. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. When somebody sees us, the work of Jesus then begins to project outward from us, and people see an entirely different authority, entirely different attitude. It's not based on rules. It's not based on some belief system or religious construct. It is simply the essence of the being that we have become. Wow. And it's no more complicated than that. But we can't do it on our own. No. We have to, we have to say, okay, dude, Jesus, I'm not picking a path. I'm not picking a belief system. I'm not, I'm picking you. Now, where do we go from here? Well, we are not told this, Steve. People are not told this. Now, I mean, I think there's an ancillary assumption of this. But you know what is funny is, you know, I was, I was, and this is somewhat unrelated, but what it speaks to this. The education system in America was built upon the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that they wanted to do and you know, you know why they have bells in schools, right? The the bell is a it's it's reminiscent and it's it's reflective of the bell that would go off in the factory. And this idea would I would get you ordered in rows, in seats, and we would do our education. And when the bell rings, we go. And I think of Pavlov's dog, right? Like I'm I'm scheduling you. I'm I'm systematically indoctrinating you to follow this this plan of the factory, right? And I know it's loose. That's pretty loose. But it's really interesting to me that the structure, and I think good-hearted people desire to have a method, right? The Methodists. And it, it makes sense. We're ruling and ordering and, you know, systematizing and trying to come up with ways. But I feel like a lot of people, and I had this problem for 28 years of my life, right? Before I knew who the Lord was and knew that he spoke and knew that he actually had a plan for me and was guiding my life, is I was like, this is a bunch of hokey crap that these folks are saying to me, these they're not saying to me that the access to the one who created it all is as simple as listening. And that's why, I mean, I, I would say that's why following after him is not a religion. Right. It's not something that you religiously do. It's not a religion. It's a so powerful. One of the other things I wanted to just say, because I'm just full of like joy, is you said something to me, and I just want to throw this out to people that are actually paying attention. I've never heard this stuff before, and all these things come together. We, you talked about the creation, the serpent, and the swords, and did God know that the serpent was there, and what the lie is, and all of these things to say, hold on, who are you made to be? 
You've been told that you're the descendant of a monkey. No, 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 no. You are a ruler to subdue, but only under the authority of the firstborn, under Jesus himself. And that this structure is in the right side world is clearly defined. And if you align yourself with that, one, there's amazing peace and blessing in that. There's benefit to it. But then you start seeing the upside down world everywhere you go. Yeah. And it becomes almost, you, you identify it so easily. You're like, oh, so that's what's happening. Someone's going their own way. Hey, Peter, get behind me, Satan. And you start thinking about that. Well, now it makes so, so much sense. Delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, yeah, he reforms you, gives you a new name, creates a new thing in you, and you move forward. And, it, and it's a discipline because you have authority to rule, to make a choice. What are you going to choose? And are you going to do that apart from me? You're going to do that with me. It's 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 beautiful in its simplicity, just like you said. I, I'll just add this little thing because you've now mentioned the Peter behind me thing. Yeah. If you go in the way that's translated, it makes Peter the bad guy because it associates yeah. Yeah. with yeah. Satan. But if you go into the definitions of the word, the message conveyed is Peter. Escort Satan behind me. Now think about that for a second, the difference. See, Peter, you get behind me, or no, Peter, you exercise the authority vested in you with me to escort him behind me. Right. Well, because once Peter identifies that he's that, that is what is influencing him, he has that authority to push away. Because it because I think that's one of the things that you, you're, boy, we're splitting a fine, fine hair here, which is to say that who you are in him is not the manifestation of Satan. Satan is actually one who can get behind yep. both of us. Yep. Yep. Wow. This whole idea, which now gets into the corruption thing that, I mean, yeah. talk about another thing that Jesus just sees things so differently than what we have been taught. But once he starts showing you and talking to you about it and explaining and describing, it's like, this is so simple. How did we miss this? Well, <laughs> it's because we were upside down. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that's what the upside down world is intended to do, to make you think you are seeing what is true. But in reality, you're seeing things upside down, not right, not correctly. Well, you know what's interesting is... I've known this for a long time, but someone said to me one time, they said, don't you think it's strange that you've got this God father, right? The father God, and you've got the son and the spirit, and you've got what we're calling the Elohim and creation. And that we know he's outside of all this, this plural nature of things that gives authority to one who comes and literally takes on all of this iniquity, takes on all this stuff so that we may be rightly related to him. And we look at him and we go, OK. And then we have this father, this son, this man, this woman, this animal. And you talk about this upside down world and it's so weird. It's like, hold on a second. The animal said to the woman, said to the man, hold on. Like the, the lie is always... 180 degrees upside down from the truth. And it's almost like the truth is embedded in the lie. And if you want to understand it, you need to turn it right side up. You need to be turned right side right up. up. Yeah. See, there's a, there's a difference. We, if we had the capacity to turn ourselves right side up, we would have done it a long time ago. We would have looked at things and said, wait a minute, this thing, yeah. something ain't right here. We got to try something different. But we right. don't because because of that the nature of that upside down world. So that's where you know it's exercising the first rule of authority. Jesus, I want to learn to hang with you. Now yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah, some dude is telling me you talk to people. You, I don't know anything about any of that. Right. But I. But my guess is you do. Will you then teach me what I need to know and how I need to learn it? Yeah. And, and that is the first rule that occurs 
in the life of a person that begins the process of being turned right side up. And it's amazing. It's like, whoa, dude. Yeah. This is way too simple. How did we mess this one up? <laughs> you know what's amazing is for those who are, are right side up or being turned right side up, it the patience and the care and the love of God to go to such great lengths, right? You know, this idea of leaving the 99 to get the one, yeah. to give the the son who comes back the robe and the fatted calf and the ring and all the stuff. It, it almost makes me weep because I go, we have gone astray. And it's almost like it wrecks you in a way. Because, you know, one of the things, I, I love church history. And I just love the, like the Great Awakenings, right, in the United States. And I love these stories of George Whitfield, who traveled across the ocean from England six times by boat. And this is like 1790s, right? Like it probably wasn't an easy boat ride. And his buddy, when he got to the States, his friend um, was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin was not, he was a deist, you know, he wasn't like a, like a, you know, super Christian guy, like maybe some of the other guys were, but he liked George Whitfield and was attracted so much to George Whitfield that he built him a building to speak in. And it's the first building that was built at the university of Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. And what's amazing at that story is that when George Whitfield would come you know, you look at like the method of grace. If you really want to dig into some amazing like early church sermons, the method of grace, like we don't, I look at what, what transpired in the great awakening and I see what they were preaching and I read this stuff and I go, we don't talk like this anymore. And it's almost like even through time, like what you're saying, it's, it's somewhat of a revival in the sense of, Hey, we're getting back to the basics, right? Jesus speaks. He's alive. Like, listen to him. Oh, so it's that simple? Even a child can understand it? Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. But then when I see the results and the fruit of this, right? Because I think a lot of people are like, I need, you know, evidence, right? You know, I need an alien to show up on the White House lawn or I'm not going to believe this stuff. Well, the same thing is true here is that if there's anything that I've learned over time is that the more and more I align myself and empty myself of myself and I, and I listen to him and I go, all right, all right, I just got to worry about today, right? Wake up and go, all right, what are we doing today? There's so many stories of, hey, I got you. I know all of these things. You are actually a son and I love you. And it's hard for people when they have the context of a father who's left them or somebody who is like, I, it's hard for me to relate to a father that would care. And I think with my dad, you know, a year tomorrow, I think about all the things that my dad did and in, in literally like to rescue me. Hmm. And it's hard because you, you think that, you know, when all is, is over, it's a list of these, what have you accumulated? What have you extracted? What have you taken? What have you socially signaled? What have you shown? How many Lambos do you have? How big are your barns? And I look at all this stuff and I go, hold on a second. Jesus is saying, the blockchain is a gift that we can animate for good that literally can turn things right side up or be a mechanism by which his name is known. And what's really amazing to me, Steve, and let's, let's kind of finish up here. There's all these miracles that I read about when I first got to, like I started like awakening and somebody told me, they said, Hey, read the book of John. And I, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm interested in this. This story sounds really cool. And I read the book of John. And of course, you know, as a, the, the drama queen that I am, I loved the story. But it recounted these, these miracles. And what was amazing about it is it, it brings up so many questions about, well, why didn't he heal everybody? And, and why is this? And the more and more I've dug into these miracles of Jesus, whether it be the feeding of the 5,000, water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, calming the storms, whatever it may be, if you really spend time looking at it, he was doing it so you would know he had the authority. Like that he was who he said he was. And when you align yourself with that and you go, hold on, so you are actually who 
you said you were. And so you told me the story that blew my mind. I'd heard the story of the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go up the mountain with Jesus, and appearing before them is Moses and Elijah. And you said, this is a representation of the law and the prophets. And of course, the disciples are like, it's awesome that we're here. Like They're seeing this so cool thing. They're like, wow, this is amazing. And they said, let's build tabernacles for each of you. And you, you like, when you said this to me, I was like, I've never heard this before in my life. And this is like the most amazing thing. In the disciples, these three men's desire to honor the three that appear before them in their desire to build equal footings for each of them, a voice came out of the sky and said, this is my son, listen to him. And when you told me that and when I thought about that, what he did in that one statement was say, Jesus is not equal. He is the, he's the guy. And I think that the establishment of his authority in many, there's multiple scenarios in which he was given that authority. And, and But it seems like, guys, I need you to know who I am and what my authority is and what my role here is and who you are in me. And so all of these things we think of, he wasn't just a magician. No, no, no. He was trying to tell you the story that you've lost from the very, very beginning of who you are in him. <sighs> it's so good. It is so good. And it's so, and you know what's interesting about it is it's not good because of the words that come out of our mouth. It's good because it resonates with my soul. And, and that's the thing. I think so many people are, are desiring to have peace in their lives and they're looking at every possible, you know, idol they can drugs and money and sex and all of these things and saying, if I just had this, and then we realize we're self-medicating and we're just numbing ourselves, and that if we only knew that the life and the joy, you know, it's almost like you can rest in him. Yes. And that's what I saw in you when we first met, by the way. Yeah. I saw that peace and that rest in you. Hmm. 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 And that's, you know, I think about this. Who do I want to be? You know, who do I want to be when I'm 71? You know, who do I want to be to grandkids? Who do I want to be to my family? You know, what is that vision for? What? Wh who do you want to be? What do you want to be like? Yeah. And I think about what are the characteristics of, of that legacy of whatever it is. And I constantly hear in the back of my mind, well done, good and faithful servant. What does it mean? And what's interesting is it's almost like when we let go, he does this work. And, and that's actually, it's almost like we drop our guard and our resistance. And it's like, remember Neo? So back to the Matrix. Remember at the very end of the movie, he realizes who he was created to be. And the bullets get shot from those guys. And he flexes and the walls go boom. And the framework of the Matrix bends to his will. And the bullets stop. And he like picks one out of, the, out of there and he looks at it. And it's almost like, hold on, this is a picture. You have been lied to, and we've forgotten who we are in him. And there's, a, there's like this amazing life awaiting us if we actually will recognize under whose authority we are. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And you had the greatest mustache of the 1970s. <laughs> Steve, I was wondering you. what attracted my wife. Thank you for solving the mystery. Uh, yeah, you knew exactly what you were doing. Dude, when you were chilling out there, I can just imagine it. Oh, my goodness. So I was watching. Somebody made a video about you. They called it The Legend of Steve Staggs. It's on YouTube. And he goes, I'm making this video because my wife um, and all the women in my life love Steve Staggs. <laughs> and I just thought, this is so great. The legend of Steve Staggs. And it's so cool, though, that um, 
that you'd be willing to take your time and invest in me. Because folks, we did this after many hours of conversation together about these similar topics. And I've decided it's my channel and I can do whatever the heck I want to do. <laughs> so for the next series of Fridays, Steve's going to come on and we're going to talk about Jesus. And if you don't like it, go look at some TA in crypto. But if you want to know about these things, it sets my heart on fire and makes me recognize the fact that we're living at one of the greatest times in human history. But if we've got a bunch of money, right? If there's a transfer of resources into a group of people who loves one another, who is aligned with the purposes, the plan and the structure and framework of creation, then there's work for us to do. And he's giving us the resources to do that work. That's amazing. Yeah. Right on. Right on. It's amazing. All right. The pistachio with the mustachio, Steve Staggs. Folks, Steve, thanks for being here. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you so much. Thank All you. right. Take my care. Course. Until we meet again next Friday, I assume, unless something comes up, folks, we get to see Steve again. And I'm sure we're going to dig into things like the story of Lydia. We're going to talk about being beggars. Oh, I'm looking forward to it, Steve. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. All right. Folks, this is why, this is it. This is it. And um, I don't know. I didn't even know what to say. Um, you know, you get to a certain point in your life and you stop caring what people think about you, right? And haters, like it's like water off the back of a duck. And I, I challenge you with that. There's so many people who have abandoned their own dreams and they just discourage yours. And here's a guy, Steve Staggs. I meet him at a Texan meetup and I shake his hand and I listen to the sound of his voice and the Lord Jesus says to me, listen to him. And then when I listen to him, you know what he says? Listen to me. That's what he says. I, I talk to him. He's like, oh yeah, don't listen to me. I'm like, what? I was told to listen to you. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm telling you, you're listening to me, but I'm telling you to listen to him. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is really, really good. Folks, We've been lied to about who we are. And here's the thing. Why are you here in crypto? Like, why are you like listening to this stuff? You, you know something's afoot, Mr. Anderson, when you pay your taxes, right? When you go to church and pay your taxes, Mr. Anderson, you know something is wrong. And you know there's an answer to this. This is the truth. I'm telling you the truth on this St. Patrick's Day. This is the truth. Try it on for size. Here's the thing. I used to work at a tuxedo shop. And at the tuxedo shop, people would come in to get measured for weddings or proms. And I'd have to measure people. And then we would say, all right, I'd measure their overarm, right? And I'd determine, all right, minus six, that's the, the, the size of their jacket, right? And so we'd take a jacket off of there and I'd put a jacket on you. And the guy would immediately go, this doesn't fit, right? So you have to try things on. And here's the coolest thing. We've been under the impression that God can't handle our stupidity. He knows exactly who we are. Try it on for size. What is Steve saying? What am I saying? Ask him. Ask him. Hey, if you're real, if you're like really in control of this whole thing, show me the way. And that's why we see so many people that are in jail and my friend who was a homeless guy that we gave a ride to years and years and years ago. And the Lord Jesus said, give him all the money you have. And I'm like, no, I'm not giving a homeless guy this money. And he's like, give it all to him. And I'm like, dude, the Lord's telling me to give you 400 bucks. Two years later, he calls me. And my buddy's like, hey, you know that guy, Gary? He wants to talk to you. And Gary's like, man, hey, I got to give you that $400 back. After two years. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay, man. Like I was told to give it to you. And he says, um, you know what I did that night? I was like, no, what'd you do? He goes, I went and bought $400 worth of crack cocaine. And I got so high. The Lord Jesus appeared to me and told me to stop doing crack. So I did. I've been sober for two years. And I think about you all the time. And I have to give you this money back. Folks, our ways are not his ways. Try it on for size. It's a journey of understanding the purpose that you've been created for. And to me, it's the truth. 
what's the, what's the benefit of gaining the whole world and losing your soul, right? Money. Okay, great. How many Lambos can you drive at once? You, you know what? Honestly, you know what I say to you if you're really, really worshiping money? Just go do it. Buy all of those things. Get all of that stuff. Share with everybody. Put on your Rolex. Tell everybody how great you are and get it out of your damn system. And let's get together and move forward with what we're supposed to be doing. He can handle that too. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt, and this is Crypto Heartbeat. And Steve Staggs, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that's all I got. Don't mess with Texas, folks. Take care of yourself.